is Yolanda Wallace with Mother's War on Violence at WCVU 89.9 FM is our sponsoring uh, of this podcast and um, I'm uh, the host and um, I want to start off with uh, a prayer and a Bible verse. I'll start with my prayer first. Father God, I ask that you would touch uh, our conversation today. I ask that it would be uplifting and inspiring to our listening audience. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. The Bible verse is, do not forget, it's found Hebrews, the 13th chapter in the second verse. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some may be unwittingly entertaining angels. I chose that Bible verse because it makes me think about strangers when you meet people, when you're, you know, um, you don't know what they need, you don't know what to expect. Um, But any stranger, we should always uh, try to be a blessing to them. And today, um, because you don't know if you're entertaining angels unaware. And today, um, our guest, our topic first is foster care. And today in our studio, we have Yolanda Riley, and I'm going to have her to tell you a little bit about herself and her story. And we'll go from there. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, I am an attorney in the Peoria County area. Uh, Sometimes I venture out into other central Illinois um, circuits. However, um, I've been practicing majority of uh, my professional career in Peoria. Um, I became licensed at the end of 2016 and began practicing uh, 2017. I've been practicing since then. Um, As of recently, I am a solo practitioner as of March of last year, and so I've been doing that. Um, loving uh, that uh, that space and being my own boss. Um, and besides private practice, I also have a contract with Peoria Public Schools where I work out of the Wraparound Center, um, providing legal assistance to Peoria County families in various areas of law. Um, I am a Peoria native and uh, pretty much been here most of my life. Um, did a stint in Georgia for about seven, eight years, but other than that, been in Peoria. And uh, manual grad, very proud of that. And Great. so I am happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Yolanda. Mm-hmm. Um, well, can you give me a little bit um, uh, about yourself and being in foster care mm-hmm. system? or? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my first uh, experience or encounter with foster care, I was uh, five years old. And I remember uh, we were residing on Lincoln. I remember the house and everything. Hmm. Um, And so um, I remember being taken at that point. And the first home um, I recall going to, I ended up in afterwards, like, I mean, years, years, years down the line. But it actually ended up being a wonderful family, one of the very few families that I resided with in my time in foster care. Um, And I keep in contact with them to to this day. Um, So from about five to eight, I think I was in foster care, Mm -hmm. and I reunited with my mom and siblings somewhere around eight, nine years old, and then we went back into foster care when I was about probably 10 or 11 years old, Mm -hmm. and I aged out of foster care at about 17, and um, then ended up going to some residential placements very briefly, and then was on my own at 17, um, 18 years old on off into college, Mm -hmm. uh, again, on my own, and I was still a ward of the state, however, because the benefit of that is that I continued to get uh, financial assistance for my college. Um, At that time, I was at ISU. So um, the majority of my childhood, um, I I was in and out of different uh, foster care homes or um, temporary homes. I'm not sure what the correct Mm -hmm. name it used (laughs) to be back then, but um, so the majority of my childhood, so It ended up being over like 20 homes last I counted, um, whether it was temporary or long, long care terms. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Your background in foster care is a little bit similar to mine's, but I went into foster care when I was about 13. So about 12, 13 years old. Um, I'm a native of Champaign-Urbana and um, 
you know, if you're an older child, it's kind of hard to find placements of foster mm-hmm. homes. So they had me to go, you know, I went to Cunningham. I went to different places, um, you know, in Champaign. And then uh, there weren't enough people to take teenagers. So the closest place to be was in Peoria. So uh, they sent me to Peoria. Um, and um, I've been here pretty much ever since. Um, but along the way, there were some, you know, different things that happened in different foster homes and different people and um, got pregnant in a foster home. Um, they shipped me to Chicago. There was a Booth Memorial Hospital where I had my child at 16. Um, and so then from there, I got shipped back to Champaign, where I was from, and um, had the baby with me in foster care. And it was hard to go to school with the baby and being in foster care. So uh, I sent my baby back here, and I came to visit on the weekends. And, um, you know, when I could, maybe, I don't know, once or twice a month or so, and then um, came back and got my baby. And then I was emancipated at 17 and then came back to Peoria and moved um, with, some friends until I got my own apartment and I've been on my own ever since so Mm -hmm. may I ask you Mm -hmm. was um when you were pregnant in foster care was this a foster relative it was not okay all right just wondered about that because you know a lot of abuse happens sometimes in foster care and I just wondered it was uh a lot of things that did happen in the foster home um that's the next thing we're going to talk about, the different things that happen in foster home, mm-hmm. which which is uh, there. there's a lot of bad things that happen in foster homes. Um, I did get pregnant in a foster home, um, and um, it wasn't a relative, um, but it was, you know, during the foster family there. Um, and then um, um, there was another foster home I was in. Well, the first, well, I went to like two or three different foster homes in Peoria, and one of the foster mothers um, had issues with color. I actually went to a couple different foster mothers who had, you know, issues with colors. Most of the foster homes didn't have a foster dad. They mm-hmm. just had foster mothers. How about yours? Um, well, I have been a lot. So, mm-hmm. you know, I... I'm not going to say. I definitely recall the ones that did have moms and dads. Mm -hmm. Um, And off the top of my head, I remember at least probably five of those, um, five or six of those. But if I had to really think about it, the majority of them were single parent homes. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. So the the foster. Well, I mean, I take that back. Maybe there was a, a. a foster dad that was there, but you know, most of the time, girls they dealt with um, the the foster mothers, um, and uh, and I went to a lot of different foster homes in such a short time because mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was a teenager, a preteen. You know, um, being a preteen, like a you know, you're just you're angry about things, trying to understand yourself, and at that age of twelve, thirteen, you know the world doesn't really feel real or you don't even know if you like yourself or, you know, just a lot of things going on. And then, um, um, but later on, I ended up going back to school years later and um, ended up getting my GED and, you know, going to school and stuff like that. But the foster homes, um, when I was emancipated, they didn't really have very much to help me with because I didn't have my high school education. So I had to, you know, there's not much they can do with that point other than, you know, teach you how to get a job and stuff like that. And um, so um, anyway, um, life in the foster homes, my favorite part of um, the foster homes was when it was time for us to go to court. Um, only because back then, you know, they always took me to McDonald's. I love the Big Macs. <laughs> so it was good, you know, yeah. to a young kid at that age, it's like, oh, it's fine, we're going to go do this. You know, so, um, yeah. But the court system is another part of the foster care system that I didn't like. Sometimes um, 
we would, you know, being a kid sitting up in there, you don't understand everything that's mm-hmm. said and, and talk to you these days. And I mean, those days. And then now they got programs like CASA where there is actually advocates that who can sit with you and do, you know, and try to explain some things with you if you have to be in court with them. Um, but for you, how about you? Did you have to go to court or anything? I don't recall going to court often mm-hmm. or at all. Um, I do recall having, I believe they used to be called ACR meetings, mm-hmm. where it would kind of be like a, every so many months they check in mm-hmm. with the kid and the uh, social worker, and it'll kind of be like a roundtable event of where this this child is uh, in the social worker's perspective or the foster parent's perspective. Um, and those would be the rare occasions where sometimes uh, the child was able to kind of chime in mm-hmm. and be asked questions. But the issue with that was that it usually were like it was in front of other people. Um, right. and, and that can be intimidating when, mm-hmm. when things are going on in the home to want to express that and bring it up. And, you know, in, that in front form. of everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that really wasn't that effective. I think would have been. Would, would have been more effective if it would have been more um, um, isolated conversations with individuals. Um, yeah. but I think when you're in foster care, for me, and you are being shuffled between a lot of not only foster homes, but social workers, mm-hmm. um, it takes time to trust this particular individual, t- you know, with these mm-hmm. uh, stories or the information you may have. And mm-hmm. a lot of times I think what occurs um Children don't want to talk. So a lot of things right. go unchecked, unnoticed, mm-hmm. um, not discussed because, you you know, you feel like this person is only temporary anyway. So why right. tell? What can you do? You right. might not even right. be here right. next week. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that became problematic. But um, I don't recall court appearances. I just recall more of those type of ACR meetings mm-hmm. every so were, often. Were, did you feel, were you ever angry about being in the foster care or the foster homes and going to meet these new people because that was an issue for me. I mean, you know, all this change, change, Mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I mean, the very first home I went to, I cried, cried, cried. I sat on the porch and I remember um, Mm -hmm. Mr. Guyton, this is the Guyton's home that I stayed Mm -hmm. in, and uh, he said, Lois, just let her sit out there. She'll be all right. Let her sit out there until she's done. Until Mm -hmm. I was done crying. And at some point he, you know, knew I'll come in and then they can you know, begin to embrace me and that process. But you get mm-hmm. a five-year-old, you snatching them from their home and taking them to a stranger's home, I'm absolutely traumatic. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. wasn't so much mad um, at necessarily the foster parents. Now, obviously, there were foster parents that were problematic. There would be some homes I'd be in, and I'm like, this is worse than the home you took me from. Yeah, I felt like, like this that, is worse too. Than mama's home. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you, you have that um, resentment <laughs> mm-hmm. um, at different stages in my life. I would resent the fact that I felt like um, maybe they weren't doing enough for my mom. I felt like there should have been more mm-hmm. support, different avenues on helping the, the parent get mm-hmm. on their feet because, you know, my mom suffered from addiction, and this isn't something you can just tell a person, go fix it and get your kids. Right, like, this right. Is, and I didn't really learn and grasp that till you know, decades later mm-hmm. about addiction. But I think right. that there, um, at that time, and I'm noticing now, too, uh, it seems like, you know, sometimes it's, they, they easily give up on the parent. You check this off or, you know, the kids are going X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so no, not necessarily. There were homes where I wasn't happy with some of the foster parents. Um, you know, I, I recall a home I experienced um, colorism in. I had um, a foster sister that was way more, that was lighter or fair, and I, you notice, know, mm-hmm. you know, differences in treatment and things right. like that. Um, you know, you can go down a line of, of various things you experience yeah. in all these homes. Um, the foster mother that had an issue with my color was that I was too bright. Mm. You just think you're so, mm-hmm. you know, close to white. You know, some of the mindset of of, of the older people yeah. back then, mm-hmm. and they they had they you know had issues with right with color. Yeah. So <laughs> I think it uh, on the spectrum of um, of black folk deal with uh, mm-hmm. colorism issues, whether mm-hmm. dark skin, light skin, all these. 
Um, I know there was a documentary not too long mm-hmm. ago. I can't remember what it was called, but very, mm-hmm. a very uh, well done documentary where you can see the spectrum of people who are more fair skinned versus mm-hmm. people who are dark skinned who mm-hmm. go through, you know, yeah, black girls magic. They did yeah. something like that as well. You know, even uh, bringing it up to today, having that issue, there was a. Uh, I was watching some stuff, you know, on the computer, and they were talking about, you know, Wakanda Forever that came out, mm-hmm. and they were saying, I guess uh, some Latinos were saying that they had an issue with a Kuku Khan and how he was so dark, mm-hmm. and they would have preferred to have a lighter, mm-hmm. complected one. And, yeah, so that's, that's kind of common, oh, you know. This is and, definitely and, not unique to, to the black mm-hmm. diaspora. Like, this is definitely yeah. in Hispanic heritage as well they Mm -hmm. have the same issues they do that we do um and that's unfortunate i know it is because you know that we're all beautiful people Mm -hmm. but um back to foster care in my younger years we actually had in down in champaign well in urbana we had um uh homemakers back Mm -hmm. then so that would have been back in the 70s there were homemakers who actually were in the house um, because there was some a lot of issues that were going on at home and our uh, my biological father wasn't there but we had a very good stepfather who I think now is where I got a lot of my work ethics from Mm -hmm. is from my stepfather and he owned a, you know, a, a tow truck and a beauty shop. And, you know, he was getting out the Navy. And so, you know, uh, he let us go after school and we could go and wax and shine cars and stuff. So I know how to detail a car, actually. Um, and so uh, the so while he was at work and some there was issues with my mother and she was in and out the hospital and stuff like that, we had homemakers this was their way back then of keeping us in the house Mm. so when you were talking about your mom and how you didn't feel like they did enough to help her uh, keep the family together and stuff like that this is what they did for us back then in the 70s and then um, and then uh, after that didn't work and things got worse you know my condition got worse then it was removal that was the last result they had Um, but when it came to the foster care and them me having a baby in the home well a lot of the foster mothers weren't too uh, happy with that because they feel like we get money for you we want money for that baby too Mm -hmm. so I'm like this is crazy so what am I gonna do you know what I'm saying I can't you know so at that time I think you got about $80 a month so $80 a month um, from, you know, uh, human service or whatever you want to call it, public aid at that time, it, it was hard. You know, they had programs that help with uh, child care while I went to school, but it was kind of hard being 16 years old and trying to figure out how to weigh this thing out and how to take care of the baby. So that's why the baby was, you know, brought back here so that I could go to school there. Maybe now that I'm older, I don't know if that was a good idea or not, but uh, when you're young, sometimes those decisions, um, you know, you, you make, and sometimes we have to suffer the consequences because when a baby is a baby, I think um, a young person doesn't understand the bonding process that happens between that child and that mother. And any interruption I've learned um during the bonding process, which is the first, you know, few years of the baby's life can really, you know, change the outcome of the closeness of the mother and child closeness. Mm -hmm. Uh, Same thing with fathers, you know, them bonding with their kids. It happens early on. Uh, Sometimes in families that we see today, there are people who have kids, but they didn't, weren't you know, they find out later on, you know, you see those shows on the Murray show, somebody, you know, uh, you ain't my baby daddy, you know, type of thing. And they were like, oh, yes, you are. And they do a blood test. And even if they do a blood test and all that kind of stuff, if they haven't had that time to bond, this is like part of the way God made us to be, you know, is to bond with our child, our children. And if they don't get that time, it's 
it's I think it's more harder for men to bond with the children than than it is for the women for mothers and um but anyway I think um, more programs uh need to be talked about and dealt with and of course they got the good beginnings program and different other programs working with children are doing an excellent job and um and your your place right now is at the wraparound center so i know they have lots of things um well how were you um meant i mean uh, uh in developmentally were you you know because you was taken from your mom at a younger age do you think you had a delay in your capability of learning and in school yeah. and stuff like that no, um, I don't. I think that... Um, when you were younger, I mean. No, you know. no. I, I um, usually were was ahead of my class, mm-hmm. at the top of the class. I took education very serious. And I think that I probably w- was the type of child that looked for that praise, you know, wanted mm-hmm. to do better because I had uh, five other siblings mm-hmm. who you know, didn't do so well academically. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was the second oldest or am the second oldest. And a lot of times. So am I. <laughs> yeah. I have the kind of job duty of being the pseudo mom in the mm-hmm. house. And so mm-hmm. as a pseudo mom, you have Me to Me be more responsible. Mm-hmm. That means I'm telling my siblings that they need to do their homework. So of course mine needs to be done or yeah. I'm having to cook and do all those things. So um, I think that I had to grow up fast Mm-hmm. And with that type of responsibility, I think that uh, bled into me performing academically um, always at the top of my class. Like, right. Um, Overachiever. So, mm-hmm. so, so, yeah. So, you know, I thought bringing good grades home was very important to you um, mm-hmm. and was expected. I mm-hmm. think that sometimes um, in a foster care system, my some of my other siblings might have been labeled as special or you know, problematic, or mm-hmm. they had all these labels on them, and I think that they mm-hmm. did not expect too much of them. Mm-hmm. And then once you are labeled that, um, you know, it's kind of like you know, they don't care too much. Um, but since I was not labeled that, mm-hmm. it was like there was a always an expectation Hope. that mm-hmm. I am going to be mm-hmm. at a certain level. So if I underperform, right. you know, that would be such a big red flag and it's a to do. Mm-hmm. In conversation, so no, I don't think that. If anything, I mean, obviously, there are uh, emotional traumas, um, defense mechanisms that I may have put up over the years because of mm-hmm. what I've seen or mm-hmm. experienced, or you know, not being as trustworthy to mm-hmm. you know people. But to that people. is just because of you know a little bit of a product of your environment. And if mm-hmm. you have been in all of these different environments, you pick up different things. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. And you know, um, I speaking of those different environments and how it affected me, it was pretty rough and it was already rough even being at home, you know, like I said, growing up with a, a homemaker uh, and sometimes she'd be white and, you know, every once in a while she'd be black or uh, we even had a Hispanic um, person. So we never know sometimes who we come home from school from. And having those withdrawn issues, and then back in those days, if you did little strange things like rock and mm-hmm. and stuff like that and fidgety a lot, and, you know, they thought that, you know, there was something wrong with you, but they didn't really do anything with you as a kid. Um, so for me, I was always rocking and up under the covers all the time. That was my a way of soothing, probably. Y- yeah, yeah, my, soothing myself. And then as I got older, I kind of find out um, through, because I major in child development, I kind of find out, like, looking at my own self and analyzing myself from the things that I learned in child development that I kind of had a high level of autism, you know. Um, uh, kids that have um, parents with mental illness and kids that have um, parents who are domestic and all these other things, they, uh, the kids end up um, paying for it. I mean, they end up, it ended up showing up, all these issues end up showing out with, with the kid, and the kid ends up reacting in these ways of being withdrawn and 
all that kind of stuff. So when I learned that in school, I just thought, oh, my gosh. You know what I'm saying? It explains a lot. Mm -hmm. It did. And I actually cried in my classes because I'm like, oh, my gosh, that was me. And I never understood it. Mm -hmm. So when I went into foster care and being so angry and, you know, at that age, trying to understand things, it just didn't make sense. And, you know, um, uh, our my mother didn't care if I was in foster homes or not or what it, you know whatever so um, it was one of those things that you learn about being what abandonment is mm -hmm. and if you learn that at a young age like you said you don't trust very many people and and I had to kind of learn how to do those type of things the one good thing I can say about uh, DCFS the Department of Family and Services um, was that we had you know, there are therapists and counselors, but you know what? I never felt like any of those counselors knew what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. It was something, it was a good attempt, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, to try and help me uh, understand and get out of the claustrophobic wall of all these new people that cause anxiety. And sometimes I uh, perspired highly because I was nervous all the time. Uh, one foster home I'd have that every time when I would, you know, um, do something different that they thought was strange, they made fun of me, you know, just things like that, that, you know, uh, people don't realize it affects the, the long kids term. long term. Mm -hmm. And um, so when it came to came down to trying to figure out my life and after I got my GED and after I went back to school, yeah, all those other things were there, but I felt like I had to push harder to get it, push harder to get that GED. I had to push harder. Well, for one, like I said, um, the thing that I learned from my stepfather of the work ethics, there was that one commercial used to come on TV all the time. And my grandma, she played it all. She just played it, turned it up louder, I guess, in a way to help us. Hope to, it soak in. Yeah, hope it soak in to us to help us. And she say, you know, that one uh, commercial about going to the Army or to the Navy, mm. be all that you can be, you know, and I wanted to be all that I could be. So grandma was a praying grandma. And um, for as much as she knew, you know, how to do back at that time. And then... Um, as I got older and, you know, even after grandma died, it became to be part of my personality, be all that I could be, to be a, a overachiever in everything that I do because it was so hard for me to get that start. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, all right. Well, um, how about uh, what do you do down there at the Wraparound Center with the... Uh, yeah, so at the Wraparound Center, I... Um, I meet with clients and have mm -hmm. free consultations mm -hmm. with individuals who qualify. So there's an, an economic um, criteria um, or a Peoria County criteria, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and for family cases, individuals who have children in, in Peoria public schools. Mm -hmm. But the areas of law that I practice are expungement sealing. That's a huge piece um, for individuals looking to seal or expunge their criminal records or arrest. Okay. Um, um, guardianship cases. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times you have these kids in Peoria Public Schools who have parents who aren't taking care of them. The grandmother may be taking care mm -hmm. of them or the aunt. Mm -hmm. And so um, getting those legal orders to say that these mm -hmm. individuals are allowed to care for them in their academics or their mm -hmm. uh, uh, medical um, procedures, etc. Um, orders of protections or stalking no contact, um, mm -hmm. landlord-tenant negotiations, um, and family cases. So there are several things under that family uh, law umbrella. Um, I've mm -hmm. just added emancipation mm -hmm. um, under that umbrella. Um, there, there's name change, something as simple as a, a name change for a child, uh, simple divorces mm -hmm. or agreed divorces, um, legal separation, um, and uh, I think that's it for the family. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so all of those different areas of law I am pausing right now mm -hmm. uh, because the um, grant I received to do this is under the R3 grant, which wraps up at the end of January. So I have to, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you have to kind of pace yourself to use the grant accordingly. So um, toward the end of January, I'll be accepting more uh, clients for the new re-up of the R3 grant. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something I'm not familiar with with yeah. the grants yet, but being a new 
501c3 that Mother's War on Violence is, I tend to learn a whole lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I see in all the things that you mentioned that you do, they're all focused around the family. Mm -hmm. And I think that's big because that's how you know that the resilience is just, <laughs> it's reeking. <laughs> You're reeking with it. Yeah. We're reeking with right. resilience and trying to reach people to heal our families. And um, uh, there's some uh, things that we would like to be reformed about DCFS. Is there something you want to add to that? You know, I I kind of, you know, as a former foster child, sometimes mm -hmm. you have to kind of keep your uh, pulse on what's going on mm -hmm. in the state. Um, and so for Illinois, I know that some things caught my attention as of the last year. Um, I know that there were some legislative acts that Prisker signed into law, one having to deal with um, exit interviews for foster children. Um, and I know that uh, essentially they were thinking it's a good idea to have kids once they are uh, either aging out or uh, exiting a foster home to uh, discuss their experiences, and I believe what I read was um, within that uh, that bill, they will also look into if there were incidents where children were abused or neglected mm -hmm. or whatever, that those foster parents that they did have, uh, uh, they would reconsider them renewing their license, and I think that's a big deal. Um, and I can't tell you everything about that in detail, but I remember it mm -hmm. caught my attention, and um, and I think that's big, because I don't recall having an exit interview. Um, and honestly, I don't recall too many individuals asking me how I feel about this mm -hmm. particular foster, you know, home or necessarily right. caring. Um, so I think that's a big piece. I like that. I like that that's moving forward. Um, and <clears> also, <throat> I think that there was another piece of legislation that um, I know that expanded the mental um, health um, the mental health uh, community, not community, but the, the mental health accessibility, accessibility oh, okay. for those who are in foster care primarily because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk about a lot of things you go through and a mm -hmm. lot of trauma it causes. And mm -hmm. I think it's a domino effect um, of these incidents uh, and people just changing environments and being a child, changing mm -hmm. environments. Um, and it what is. that has on their, the psychological their mental damage. health. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that expanding that um, is, is helpful. But I think the problematic part, and I don't know what the solution is necessarily, because there's been a lot of money since um, Governor Prisker has gotten into office, poured mm -hmm. into DCFS. But I think it's like, how is it being used? It's a yeah. lot of money. But you still see, you know, lack of um, lack of involvement as it um, not an involvement, lack of placement, mm -hmm. the availability of uh, a foster home placement, especially as it relates to those who are older foster children mm -hmm. or, you know, teenagers right, who right. are dealing with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder for those group of kids to, they are, it to is. find placement. And I think that... Because they're going to have to grow up and become independent and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. and it's all going to depend on... Like I said, how you treat a, tr a stranger while they're there, whether it be there for a temporary placement mm -hmm. or if it's there long term, you know, yeah. or if they just visiting from home to home. Because, you know, you have some of those foster care homes that are there temporarily mm -hmm. and they're like, you know, what difference does it make? Because I'm only here for a little bit. Right. All that time that you're with them is going to make a difference in their mm -hmm. life and how they see life and what what because you know even you and I could look today and look back on our past of the different foster mothers and I could tell you some that I've seen that cared and I could tell you most of them felt like they was just getting a check, check. Mm -hmm. the kids know yeah. we know you feel really that. yeah you can yeah. feel that negative energy or yeah. that whatever that is you know we 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 kind of um I, I don't know. I, I think that the way that as a society, the way they place foster homes now um, with everything being a lack of people who want to work and stuff, I, sometimes I just don't think they really uh, screen them that well. That is that is. I mean, because I, I even have had some people, uh, even some friends that have had some foster home foster kids and 
And and and people are always asking me, Yolanda, why don't you be a foster mother? Mm mm. I I know myself. Um mm. A foster mother, a foster father, whatever in the foster care system. Period. You have to, you, you should take a lot of time with them. You know what I mean? You know, what you, I, I you was just talking just, to my friend about this. It's just not just a check. It's yeah. you're investing in somebody's life, mm-hmm. and, whether you know it or not, negative or positive, you yeah. know? And I, and I was talking to my friend about this, um, about how it seems like there are maybe a lot of hoops to jump through to become Mm -hmm. a foster parent at first. Mm -hmm. But then after you jump through those hoops and you get that license and you get that kid, I Mm -hmm. feel like there's no checks and balances afterwards. There's not enough, you know what I mean, following up. Um, So the process, and that was back then, seemed to be strenuous for some. It is. But then once it's like, once you get in there, though, the amount of cases you hear about child death and abuse and Mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of, welfare checks that go, you know, unchecked or, Mm -hmm. you know, they close the case unfounded, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, You hear so much about that, but it has, it's like something horrendous has to happen first. Um, Like the little boy, the eight-year-old Naveen, uh, that was um, abused and he was 30 pounds when they, you know, finally seen him. And it's just like, my heart just broke every time I think about that little boy because it's like, that could have happened to any child, you know. Unfortunately, it was that one was family related, but there's a lot of s- scenarios that are mm-hmm. very close to that that mm-hmm. I've heard about, you know, um, that end up in the newspaper every day now. Yep. So. So yeah, I think that um, I appreciate, and I'm 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 glad to hear the mm-hmm. like the expansion of the mental health services. Yeah, the exit interviews are great. Mm-hmm. I think that, again, like I said, once you get into foster care, there should be like checks throughout, though, not just when you exit, because mm-hmm. um, these kids need to know that someone's hearing them if they're going through it at the time, not when it's all over. And let me tell right. you about what I've been through. Um, <laughs> Years later, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, but I also appreciate that. I think that they are also trying to make an effort for them, the kids, to be more prepared to transition into adulthood um, mm-hmm. and to be That's you know, self-sufficient and, and independent. Mm-hmm. Um, and thinking about when I transitioned from being on my own at 17 to going mm-hmm. into college, I don't recall too much, you know, direction. I happened to figure it out, you know, as I mm-hmm. went along. But it would have been helpful for a lot of those that, that can't figure it out to have, like, classes and courses on how to become independent, how to write a check, uh, open yeah, a, a checking yeah. account, what are taxes and things like that. That would have been very useful mm-hmm. um, for a 16, 17, 18-year-old to know, especially coming out of foster care. So. Exactly. And finishing school and stuff like that and how important it is and see what they're going to do after that. It seems like you had a lot of support going into college afterwards and the programs that they had you know, to help you. I wouldn't say that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I do okay. remember I, I, I was in this independent living program. It mm-hmm. was like through the children's home. Mm-hmm. And um, for a time for me to be, I think, accepted or something, I had mm-hmm. to be like a group home first. So I was like in a group home establishment for it was very short lived because right. uh, they kind of see they saw very early on like she not necessarily she don't need this much attention. Right. And so <laughs> I ended up getting my own place where they, you know, helped with rent. You know, you pay mm-hmm. a portion of your rent just to mm-hmm. try to teach you independence. Right. Um, but I remember that experience where I had at that time adults social workers Mm -hmm. who had access to my house right and would come in all times of the day doing (laughs) inappropriate things and i ended up leaving the you know that particular apartment that i had Mm -hmm. so i left that i voluntarily checked out um and and so because i left i left the program and so you know there might have been a time where i would have gotten more support Mm -hmm. but because i was like yeah this is not gonna work this is you know i mean like this is inappropriate and i'm not going to put myself in this situation um Mm -hmm. and i left and i I chose to figure it out on my own so there might be or there might have been back then other programs to help me get prepared for college Mm -hmm. um but it really was like apply get in Mm -hmm. i remember one of my former foster parents helped me get to isu right because i really wanted to go to howard but it was like how am i going to get there (laughs) And so it was like, well, I guess I'm a, you know, I remember Mm -hmm. she put what she could in her van and and got me there. Um, 
But that was a foster parent that I was long done right, with that right. helped me get there. That was a um, blessing. That wasn't the state. Mm-hmm. Um, but now once I got in school, so long as I kept my GPA mm-hmm. up, you know, they continued to pay for my tuition and right. et cetera. And then I got scholarships for other things. But, but no, I don't recall there being like a system in place that was like, let me help you prepare for it. And if it was through the children's homes, which I was there temporarily, mm-hmm. I wasn't long enough, to, you know, there long enough to figure it out. Right. So I had um, Lutheran, when I came to Peoria, I had Lutheran ser- social services involved with us a lot. And uh, we had, I had two um, men that were my caseworkers, and I just didn't feel like they were really in tune with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they didn't even care. One time I was in a foster home and I got my tooth knocked out. They didn't care. Mm-hmm. It was like, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, I, of course, when I got older and stuff, I was able to take care of that stuff on my own, but it was just like uh, uh, the fo- the uh, DCFS workers that I have ran into here recently and seen and stuff, you know, uh, their load seems like they're way more heavier mm-hmm. than they were back then mm-hmm. from my observation, you know, standing too far off. And um, and like I said, I know um, post-COVID it's effective, mm-hmm. you, know, um, you know, affecting, you know, how many people they have to work and uh, going and, into homes, yes, and, all and that going stuff. into homes, Visits, and, yeah. and the statistics say that during COVID, all those things, uh, you know, shot up the mm-hmm. abuse levels, the uh, you oh, know absolutely. domestic violence, the you know mm-hmm. uh, we could go on. All those numbers went up. So, um, but um, I am thankful now that I look back that God did keep us because. We could have been way worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, I do have some friends that I met um, in the foster care system, in different group homes that I was at that really don't have such a good turnout. Mm-hmm. You know, I may not be what I want to be. I'm definitely not what I used to be. And uh, being up in Chicago, that foster home, I mean, that um, group home, because group homes are different than foster yeah. care homes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, learning how to be in a gang and stuff to uh, defend myself. That stuff happens for real, you mm-hmm. know. It's not that uh, everybody wants to be in a gang when you're in the foster care system, but that type of thing it's happens. Just, it feels like you, it's a necessity because you it, need somebody to protect you. Yeah, yeah, because I was afraid. I'm like, I don't know these people, you right. know. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but anyway, um uh, Yolanda, do you have anything else that you would like to add as far as what could be done? Um, you know, uh, if you're talking to foster mothers today, um, any suggestions for our listening audience? I think uh, for foster parents today, I think that if I had a suggestion, I think that it would be to continue to try to be in tune with the child that you're caring for emotionally Mm -hmm. um, and listening to them. A lot of times kids in those positions, like we talked about Mm -hmm. earlier on in the conversation, don't feel like they could trust people. People. Um, And to make sure if it's not provided through the state that they have some access to either um, uh, mental health services or Mm -hmm. counseling services. Um, I think because a lot of times people think take things personal when a, a kid is behaving a certain way, but this is so ingrained in them, um, sometimes from birth mm-hmm. with what they've been going through, trauma the trauma, and, drama. and they have mm-hmm. to understand that uh, it takes a, a different level of patience mm-hmm. um, and understanding, um, and uh, that helps them in the long run mm-hmm. to get them access to mental health services and mm-hmm. counseling services and things and like that. It helps with healing. Yes. The inner and child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. I've, I've even done some um, research for myself to do some reading and, you know, and like I say, I like to journal sometimes. It's, and I learned that young, early on, that that was, it was better to write it out and to mm-hmm. stick it instead of keeping it in. Mm-hmm. Because that's what I would probably say to a foster child. You know, you're not going to be a kid forever. Right. You know, do the best that you can. In spite of the obstacles, keep going. Yeah. Don't give up. Because yeah. when you give up, the 
the things that are going to happen then are going to be way worse than mm-hmm. the rewards of keep going. Yeah, you know, and to the foster children to speak up too. Mm-hmm. A lot of it's it's hard to find your voice as a child. Because um, sometimes sexual things happen in mm-hmm. the foster homes, and they get raped, and these kids feel afraid and can't mm-hmm. tell nobody. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, just... and pure emotional and verbal abuse as well. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, when I had a foster mother, she we had bad report cards because I, I had you know some learning issues and things. And guess what the foster mother would do? Mm-hmm. She had a beauty shop, and she would post up our bad report cards oh, all wow. around town so everybody could see them. That sounds like these these Instagram and TikTok <laughs> moms now that 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 uh, abuse and punish their their kids out in the open and for the world that to see. That is so sad. So, social media, mm-hmm. um, and they they take on more. Uh, sometimes you know the abuse is worse with the mm-hmm. foster home than it is from them coming from their. That's exactly you know unfortunate yep, place. Said, so. Yep. To be like, I wasn't this bad at home. Exactly. Like, what am I, into? I said, I said the same yeah. thing. I thought, oh wow, what in the world? What's love got to do with it? Right. Is love here? Is does love live here anymore? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, well, thank you for um, joining us for our podcast, um, Yolanda Riley. Um, this is Mother's War on Violence with WCBU. And we ask that you have a great day. Thank you.